call Member for Warringah. Thank you, Speaker. I rise to respond to the annual climate statement, uh, which was delivered last year, and for which uh, the Climate Change Minister delivered his second annual uh, climate statement. Um, and we had the Climate Change Authority's annual progress report. Now, uh, I rise to respond to that annual climate change statement. I have to note that the debate in this place is still uh, fairly disappointing, and we are seeing yet again the coalition uh, dig the hole a little deeper, if it's possible, on this policy area, uh, with a complete void of credible response and policy and an insistence on going down a pathway that uh, is just not feasible. The insistence on talking of only nuclear in a situation where time is of the essence. Uh, cost and time are of the essence. They are the two primary considerations. And uh, the reality is, and in fact members of the coalition have been uh, on the record pointing out that it's a delaying tactic because it means nothing occurs for 15 to 20 years. It is essentially about keeping fossil fuels in our system. So in any event, to talk about what climate change and what the annual statement really highlights is the urgency, the status of where we're at when it comes to global warming and emissions the progress that has been made by the government uh, since the last election, the change of government, and there have been, and I welcome, the significant policy steps and investment to assist with the nation's transition to net zero. But we also have to be real to call about the facts. It's disappointing to see that Australia's total emissions still increased over the last 12 months and that the Climate Change Authority's report outlines we are not yet on track to achieving net zero by 2050. And we know that is probably not sufficient to get keep us to the safe temperature goal. 2023 was a year of record temperatures and the ocean saw crazy spikes in temperature. More importantly, we're not on track to stay true to the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement targets to aim to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees or to keep under 2 degrees at the very least. We are on track probably to pass 1.5 degrees this year or within the next sort of couple of years. We are already tipping over it occasionally. So whilst we have fantasy discussions sometimes in this place, it's really important for the Australian public to be reminded of the very dire reality and the real facts that matter. Our next nationally determined contribution under the Paris Agreement will be for 2025. That NDC must be ambitious. We must accelerate our ambition. Australia has a responsibility to be a leader in this place and to set the example. State governments are already doing it. We are not yet seeing that indication from the federal government. And in an absence of tension or even remote re realistic policy from the opposition, it's clear that push is going to need to come from the Australian public, from the Australian businesses, from the sector, uh, and, and clearly from the crossbench. We must aim, our next NDC under the Paris Agreement must aim to be at least 75 per cent emissions reduction by 2035. So the key messages coming out of this annual climate change report. In a nutshell, Australia's just transition to a prosperous net zero economy is slowly emerging, but much more is needed. The Climate Change Authority's annual report tells us what 1.1 degrees Celsius of warming looked like in 2023. Wildfires in Hawaii, Spain, Greece and Canada. Floods in China, India, Pakistan and Nigeria. Heat waves in the United Kingdom, Europe and India. July 2023 was the hottest month in over a century of global temperature records, and thousands of climate records have been exceeded worldwide. We need total emissions to start coming down significantly and fast. Last year's emissions did not go down, and in particular, transport and agriculture have increased, leading to total emissions increased by four metric tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent. So to put this into perspective, the Climate Change Authority says that we must decarbonise at an average rate of 17 metric tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent, some 40 per cent faster than what our current annual rate of decarbonisation has been since 2009. So to achieve this, it is essential the government establish sectoral targets to drive emissions reduction in every sector. On a positive note, it is pleasing to see the government has accepted some 39 out of the 42 recommendations by the Climate Change Authority. It's excellent to see a focus now on adaptation planning and a move to legislate for climate risk assessment. The government will soon be required to do this. Uh, the business, uh, we absolutely need to do the 
to do this. The recommendation four of the report, in fact, mirrors the uh, provisions I had in the climate change bills that I um, uh, put to the last parliament to legislate national climate risk assessment to be undertaken and national adaptation plans to be updated at a minimum of every five years with monitoring of the plan. There is strong support for these provisions, so I urge the government and the opposition to legislate this without delay. If there is one responsibility of government, it is to keep communities safe, and that is, requires assessing the risk and adapting to that risk. So the cost of climate change, right? Uh, we talk a lot about the cost. The Insurance Council of Australia has noted in 2022 that since 2005, Commonwealth expenditure on disaster relief has been $24 billion. Since 2019-2020 Black Summer bushfires, insurers have paid out more than $16.8 billion in natural disaster claims for 13 declared catastrophes and five significant events. By 2050, Australian households will be paying some $35.24 billion every year in 2022 dollars for the direct cost of extreme weather. So just pause and think about that when you're hesitating to think about should we deal with climate change and reduce emissions. So I welcome the recommendations in the report, in particular around methane, and the review, which were then mirrored uh, in the report reviewing the Engo Act uh, review in relation to monitoring and measuring methane. Methane is 80 times more potent at capturing heat than even CO2 in the first 20 years of emissions. So if there is any sense that we need to urgently avoid key tipping points that are fast approaching, it is we must deal with methane. Um, so to that end, the report, the Climate Authority has made recommendations and I will be engaging with the government to ensure we adopt those uh, recommendations and ensure we have good monitoring and measurement around methane and we stop venting and flaring. We must stop methane just being allowed to leak out into the atmosphere. It is accelerating us towards key tipping points. We know we need to uh, move away from gas. Gas is not a transition fuel. It is accelerating our short-term emission and global um, heating. Household electrification must be a critical step in our transition. We talk a lot about cost of living. Many in this place talk about it. One of the key variables to household expenses are energy, our insurance, and these are all impacted by climate change, ironically. And so if we transition away from fuels um, that are inflationary, that we move towards electrification of households, we absolutely can make a difference. But it's a win-win, reduce emissions and reduce cost of living impacts and the, the instability. Transport emission sectors are continuing to rise. We need to have much clearer targets around that. I welcome the announcement by the government around fuel efficiency standards, but more is going to be needed. Electric vehicle sales may have increased from 2 to 9% for new vehicles, but that needs to accelerate. We need to have much greater investment when it comes to public transport to ensure we move away from single vehicle uh, and to much more uh, efficient modes of transport. There are a lot of steps that have been announced by the government to head in the right direction, but what we know is we still can do a lot more. It's reassuring to see new initiatives such as the expanded capacity investment scheme and the upcoming hydrogen Head Start programs. However, the government is in support of building of the recommendations of the Samuels Review, for example, um, it's dragging its heels when it comes to the EPVC Act, which is a key element to how we are going to ensure we get to net zero. We need to ensure that protection of the environment. The most natural way we can sequester carbon is through forests. And yet we still have incredible rates of deforestation and both sides of government resisting an end to native forest logging. We absolutely have to do this. There's no point on spending millions and billions into technologies like carbon capture and storage when your most natural storage is actually through maintaining native forests. The EPVC Act review and amending that is urgently needed, uh, and I will be working with the government and proposing amendments around uh, introducing a climate risk assessment of applications, especially where uh, projects are likely to become stranded assets, where there is climate financial risk at play. It's really important that uh, we acknowledge the risk 
to, of climate change from a national security perspective, and I'll continue to push the government to release the Office of National Security's risk assessment around the impacts of climate. So I welcome the report, but I urge the government to get more brave and more ambitious when it comes to dealing with climate.